Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by my friends at Nature Box. Order great tasting and healthy snacks. Get them delivered right to your door. Delicious stuff like sweet blueberry almonds. In fact, you can get a free trial. You can get a sampler box with some of their most popular flavors. You can go to naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. Naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. I'm a little nervous tonight. For those of you who follow my personal Facebook page, the Seth Andrews page, where I post just life stuff, you know, just the dogs and the cats and vacation and, you know, just the kind of stuff that most people put on social media, you probably know that my computer is on its last legs. Now, I'll spare you the sob story, but I mean, this is it's not just an office computer. It is a production computer that is always in motion. It's always editing. It's always exporting. It's always editing. It's always exporting. And I have run this thing through the paces, and I started to have some problems with it. And now I've got, on average, four blue screens of death a day. So it's, it's breathing. But I'm terrified that sometime over the next 90 minutes as we do the radio show together, that it's going to just decide that the show is over. Uh, I have ordered a new computer. I finally just said, screw it, right? I'm sick of putting Band-Aids on it. I get frustrated, too. I'm not one of those people who can sit and nitpick at tiny problems. I'm very big picture. So it's a character flaw of mine. But after a while, I'm like, oh, just screw it. Just fix it. Assemble this. I want it to do this. Ship it to me, please. So that's what I did. And it should be here, I'm hoping, in the next week, 10 days. Thank you, by the way, to those of you who ask for the opportunity to help out with that. I mean, if you enjoy the work on the thinkingatheist.com, you enjoy the shows, you want to help out with the expense of a production computer, thank you for that. All those little expenses add up. And so those who have joined up with the Patreon channel or donate online or support the sponsor, you are really genuinely helping. And I really do appreciate it. You know, it's a pleasure to be able to bring you this content every single week. So it means a whole lot to me. Thank you very much. Coming up here on the podcast calendar, I am attempting to get the audio of the debate between Faisal Saeed Al-Muttar and C.J. Werleman from the Apostacon event as they talked about ISIS, or ISIL, and whether or not it is motivated by religious ideology or it's just a political animal. And these two guys have diametrically opposed points of view. Well, I got the audio back from the sound feed, and it's not great. And I'm trying to decide if it can be cleaned up well enough to broadcast as next week's show. So next Tuesday's podcast may or may not be about about Islam, really. It's the larger umbrella of Islam. Is it a religious force? Is it a political force? And the audio of the exchange. And it was a spirited debate at Apostacon. These guys were going very good-natured, but they were both very, very passionate about the subject. And they could, in many ways, could not have been more opposed as far as their perspectives are concerned. And uh, so I'm going to try to get that together. I think it's certainly a discussion worth hearing. After that, we're going to get into Halloween mode as we talk about the things that scare us. In fact, the name of that show is called This Scares Me. So if you have a fear, a rational fear, an irrational fear, sometime between now and October 14th when the show airs, send me an email and tell me about it. We'll talk about the nature of fear and how it motivates us and what it does to us and the psychology of fear. It's going to be an interesting show. That's happening on the 14th of October. The email address is podcast at thethinkingatheist.com. And then on the 21st, it is Ghost Stories 2014, the annual tradition. 
And I'm already compiling and assembling some great stories. And if you've got a great ghost story that you'd like to share, maybe it's something that you think happened in your own life, or it's something that you heard or read somewhere, and it's been one of your favorites, it really chilled you to the bone and you want to share it, I'd be happy to read as many of those as I can on the radio on the 21st. Again, the email address is podcast at thethinkingatheist.com. When I first did the Ghost Story Show, I took some heat from some in the audience who weren't really used to an atheist podcast that talked about non-atheist things. I think in some ways the audience was still getting to know me. Why are we having to listen to this? This has nothing to do with free thinking and skepticism and religion and atheism. I'm out of here. And they leave. Of course, they make the big announcement when they leave. They just didn't get it. You know, from time to time, we'll hit the brakes and do something different. Geez, don't you want to talk about something else from time to time? Don't you want to color things with some humor and, and you know, sit around the virtual campfire and enjoy the Halloween holiday to come in. Most people do. In fact, I've had people talk about this particular episode for months. I see them at conventions. We can't wait till your Halloween show. It's just so wonderful. One lady said she was out jogging. I guess it was at dusk. And she listened to, I think it was the uh, story about Annabella. Is it Arabella or Annabella? The, the little doll that walked up the stairs and the little girl's room was at the top of the stairs. And the doll would announce in the middle of the night, Lucy, I'm on the first step. I'm on the fifth step. And then the following day, they found the girl's body at the bottom of the stairs with the doll next to her. I guess she heard that as she was out jogging. And I don't know if she turned around and went home. (laughs) But she definitely increased her speed to get out of there. And that's a great compliment to a storyteller. If you can get somebody there mentally, where they're taking that journey with you right there in their brain, that's where the best scares happen. Anyway, forgive me for digressing that far on that, but I'm I'm excited about October. I think it's going to be an awesome time. We'll uh, get into tonight's podcast and anger, which is our theme. After I say a quick thank you out to our sponsor tonight, it's great to have a sponsor on the show, and thanks to those of you who get it. I've had a few hipsters bitch and moan about one sponsorship on a free podcast, If you don't get how awesome it is to have a great company like NatureBox supporting a show like this with controversial topics, then you just won't get it anyway. And I'm glad to have them. In fact, they're doing something special right now for our listeners. They're offering a sampler box of their five most popular flavors. So if you're not sure about them, you can give it a shot with a free trial. Zero artificial ingredients, zero trans fats, zero high fructose corn syrup. It's a great alternative to junk. I just filled up my new box, which will ship here in about a week. We're doing apple cinnamon crave. We're doing the South Pacific plantains this month. Sriracha roasted cashews. That's three months in a row on those. Hotter than fire and freaking delicious. We're doing the baked peppery potato sticks and the roasted Peruvian corn kernels are in my box, which is coming in just a few days. So check them out. Support the show and try out some Nature Box with a free trial and a sampler box delivered for free right to your door. Just go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. That's naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. I'm going to begin tonight not with an email from one of our listeners, but from an article that was published in November of last year at none other than Charisma News, a religious website. I just wanted to set it up like this by sharing the words of Jennifer LeClaire, who posted an article that said this, Why do atheists get so angry when Christians talk about their unbelief? Atheists don't believe God exists, so why do they get so angry when Christians call them out for it? In my Watchman on the Wall column earlier this week, I wrote about how the atheist agenda wants you to turn your back on Christ. Now, I can see you in your chair. You're starting to bounce a little bit. Just chill, all right? Just get through the article with me. We'll do it together. She says, as of Friday morning, there were 1,158 comments on the article. I'm not sure I've ever seen so many comments on a story on charismanews.com. The atheists swarmed all over the article because Hemant Mehta who refers to himself as the friendly atheist, made some not-so-friendly remarks about me in his Pathios column. Christian publication warns of atheist agenda. They want you to lose your faith. But Meta was pretty friendly compared to the folks who read his article and commented on mine. 
After a long diatribe against me and my article, a CharismaNews.com commenter named David the Sandman concluded his spew by saying, When your church pews are like the ones in my country gathering dust and mostly empty, you know who to really blame. Intolerant and deceptive fools like yourself who clung on to those privileges and bigotries and needlessly slagged off any who didn't, one who adhere to your own narrow definitions of faith, lying for Jesus is lying all the same. Shame on you. Another commenter, Stephen, wrote, Christianity, because you were so bad, you made God kill himself. And Ohio atheist quoted the Bible and told me I had no right to speak, according to 1 Timothy 2.12. He's actually right, if she holds to the Bible. Back to the article. Meanwhile, an anonymous commenter suggested if you can sit down and tell a four-year-old that they'll go to hell if they don't follow your religion, you aren't fit to have children. Mario opined, I would laugh if you stupid fuckwits weren't so sad in trotting out the same stupid, tired arguments about what's an abomination in the sight of your stupid, puny God. I cannot get a person to turn his back on his faith. By the way, they bleeped out certain strategic letters in fuckwit <laughs> because it is Charisma News' website. <laughs> but I figure I'd just say the word, you know, it's, that's what they said. Another guy who calls himself the cranky humanist told me, I just don't get it on my Twitter account. I'll stop there, but it doesn't get any friendlier. So why are some atheists so angry? I'm hardly the first one to ask that question. In a video, our friendly atheist Meta tackles the question, why are atheists so angry, asking, why do we get so worked up about something we don't even believe exists? He admits there are angry atheists and acknowledges it doesn't seem to make any sense that atheists would get so worked up about something they don't believe in. Then the friendly atheist offers the reasoning behind so many ticked-off atheists. Quote, but you try living in a country where just about every elected official believes in God and then believes that God and their faith should be the basis of policy making. You would get upset too. Or if you had to say prayers in school or recite the Pledge of Allegiance saying we are a nation under God, or you saw religion everywhere, you went in city council meetings in your family at every event you attended, then yeah, you might get a little upset at all this delusion that's all around you. And it's not just someone's private beliefs, it's something they want you to be a part of as well. You might get a little ticked off. Meta also mentions the many abuses in the name of religion, and went on to say a few other things that weren't so friendly toward Christians. He's right about that part. The bottom line, and any Christians reading this should feel free to correct me, she says, if I'm wrong, is this. Christians want atheists to, quote, be part of our faith because we don't want them to spend an eternity in hell. I'm going to come back to that in just a second, okay? It's called love, and true Christians are sharing their faith for the right reasons. I can't speak for all Christians, but I don't think born-again believers are inherently better, nicer, or more trustworthy than atheists, as Meta suggests is the Christian mindset in his video. All humans have the same carnal nature, and I know plenty of Christians who have poor attitudes. I don't defend poor attitudes or poor character, and I don't think Christians should shove their beliefs down anyone's throat. But friendliness alone won't take you any place you want to go when you die. Atheism, and this is the paragraph that's going to send you into orbit. Atheism is rooted in an antichrist spirit that has made man his own god. Atheists have separated themselves from God in this life, yet he still blesses them with an opportunity to repent every day. In the next life, eternal life, atheists won't be so brazen about insisting God doesn't exist because they will bow their knee to Jesus Christ before spending forever apart from his presence in the lake of fire calling Christians nasty names and insulting God isn't going to change that or stop Christians from sharing their faith. I would challenge every atheist who's reading this article to truly seek God with an open mind. I guarantee if you open your heart, ask Him to reveal Himself to you and seek Him sincerely, you will find Him. All right, let's come back to that. 
The reason that Christians want atheists to be a part of their faith is because they love them and want to see them escape hell. Very often this is absolutely true. They believe in a real devil, a real heaven, a real hell, and they want to see everybody, as many as possible, in heaven, escaping torment. Right? Now, the whole time they're doing that tap dance in their brain, adoring and pledging lifelong loyalty and love to the deity that created the worst torture chamber imaginable, beyond imagination, in fact, and hand places people down there to writhe in agony forever for his own pleasure. And don't tell me it's not for his own pleasure. He's omnipotent. He could do whatever he wants. He could annihilate us. He could torture us temporarily. But no, 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 this is forever. That is sadism. But there are some people who don't operate because they simply want to see us avoid hell. They are a herd, right? They are looking for affirmation, validation. The more people who think like me, the more I must be right. This is common in all people, I think. You know, people of all shapes and colors and stripes and beliefs and cultures and whatnot can be guilty of this. Do it my way. Validate me. And I will feel better about myself. I think that drives a lot of people inside and outside of religion. Now, there are probably atheists that do it. I hate the fact that the article pitches love while it threatens hell. And you, it's not even an implied threat. It's a direct threat. Atheists won't be so brazen about insisting God doesn't exist because they will bow their knee to Jesus Christ. What an unbelievably convenient threat. Because we'll be dead before anyone can prove that you were wrong. That kind of thing makes me angry. It's not a rabid anger. It's not an irrational anger. I'm not shouting at the top of my voice angry. It's not a defining anger, but it, yeah, it kind of makes me angry. And you know, as I went through the email inbox and began to read very personal letters from members of our audience, I once again realized that I'm not the only one. Now, people don't think angry atheist when they think of me. They just don't. They think I'm squishy, remember? I'm the teddy bear. I have my moments, and in fact, I'm going to cap the show with my own thoughts about anger in my own life. And I'll use that to close the broadcast today, but right now I'd like to share the stories that have been brought to us by our listeners. I'll start with Lisa, who said this. She said, I am an angry atheist. Not all the time, mind you. Most of the time, I'm fairly happy and content. Like a volcano, minding its own business. On the surface, you see green plants, inviting lakes, beautiful views. Underneath the facade, there's a raging inferno. That raging inferno started out years ago as a child on the playground during a game we called King of the Mountain. Everyone, both girls and boys, were invited to play. The object was simple. Fight your way to the top of the dirt pile and become king of the mountain until someone dethrones you. A few other girls attempted to play the game. They were content to watch from a distance. Not me. I knew I had what it took to become king. The game began in a wild dash to the, quote, mountain, with pushing and shoving and tripping. I was fast, but never fast enough to be the first to reach the top. And so I'd have to fight my way through the crowd like the rest. One boy, usually the fastest, made it to the top of the hill and immediately began defending his territory. On one particular day, while playing King of the Mountain, I found myself really kicking some serious ass. I was totally unstoppable. I had, in some miraculous moment, become the Incredible Hulk. I must have been pissed off that day, and I was taking my anger out on the boys. At any rate, the boy at the top could see the fire in my eyes and the way I was throwing the other boys off the mountain like ragdolls. And suddenly he yelled, Stop that girl! Don't let her get to the top! No fucking girl can be King of the Mountain! For a moment, everyone stopped. Even I stopped. And then it happened. Every boy came at me. They grabbed me and carried me off the mountain and threw me to the ground. A mighty cheer went up and they had won. I sat in a heap of dust with tears of humiliation running down my cheeks. The boys were laughing and congratulating each other. They were all standing in the mountaintop together, laughing at the girl in the dirt. The girls who were watching only shook their heads as if to say, Stupid girl. 
Fast forward now from an elementary playground to a district council meeting where an ordination service is taking place. Soon, three young men will become ordained ministers with the Assembly of God denomination. Among them, two former Bible school classmates and my husband. All four of us had recently graduated from the same Bible college with the same Bible degree. Of the four, I had the second highest grade point average and had graduated with honors. Yet, I was not allowed on the mountain that night. Instead, I was seated in the front row among the wives of the ordination candidates. The other two wives were beaming with pride while I was fighting back bitter tears of disappointment and humiliation. Just a few weeks before, I'd been told by the district officials that I didn't need ordination because my husband was being ordained. Never mind that I wanted to be ordained. I'd work my ass off to be ordained and deserved to be ordained, yet no one stood up for me, not my husband, not my fellow classmates, not even the ordained women in my district. It was king of the mountain all over again. The humiliation I felt on the playground as a small girl was multiplied a hundred times that night during the ordination service. The anger it woke up in me only grew with the additional injustices, discrimination, sexism, homophobia, and rejection I endured at the hands of the church for over 30 years. A church playground where the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit is seated on the throne, and no fucking girl is ever going to be the king. Not me. I am out, and I am angry. Lisa, thank you for the message. Jeremy said, in my home province of Quebec... Religion and theology are not very discussed subjects. Most of my friends, and in fact most people I know, are either apatheist or silent about their beliefs. And even though religion's not a subject that comes up often, I'm known among my Facebook friends to be an angry, strident, and outspoken advocate of atheism. I'm the guy who will often post memes mocking religion on my page. I'll have debates with the few religious people I encounter if they want to. And I watch anything I can watch from your buddies Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Raw, as well as Sam Harris, Lawrence Krauss, and Hitchens, etc. Some of my friends forced me to ask myself a deep question. Since religion never had a huge negative impact on my life or on my society, what led me down that path of being such an angry atheist? Is it just me being rebellious? Is it just me attacking an easy target to feel superior? and have this deep thinker image of myself? These are all valid questions. So I had to dig deep down in my memories to look for an answer. Why has religion always fascinated me, and why do I despise it so, even though I've never really felt attacked by it? And I remembered my beloved grandmother and a story she told me when I was a child. The story was The Little Match Girl. Here's a brief summary to put you and the audience in context. On a cold New Year's Eve, a poor girl tries to sell matches in the street. She's already shivering from cold and early hypothermia. Still, she's afraid to go home because her father will beat her for not selling any matches. She shelters in a nook and sits down. Let me pause for a second. I actually heard Garrison Keillor do like a reading of this story in front of a live audience during Christmas time, of all things. Go figure. Back to the story. The girl lights the matches to warm herself. In their glow, she sees several lovely visions, including a Christmas tree and a holiday feast. The girl looks skyward and sees a shooting star. And then she remembers her dead grandmother saying that such a falling star means someone is dying and is going to heaven. As she lights the next match, she sees a vision of her grandmother, the only person to have treated her with love and kindness. She strikes one match after another to keep the vision of her grandmother alive for as long as she can. Running out of matches, the child dies, and her grandmother carries her soul to heaven. The next morning, passers-by find the child dead in the nook and take pity on her. My grandmother's a great storyteller, always smiling, very warm and invested in the story she tells. She left out the part about the father beating the little girl, aware that it could be a little rough on me. When she ended the story by telling me about the little girl going to heaven, she avoided actually saying to me that the little girl died. But I knew, even as a child, that it was so. 
I saw that she was trying to make it sound like a good, happy ending, even though it was actually a horrible ending. With good intentions in mind, she tried to teach me with that story that no matter how harsh life can be, you'll be saved and have an eternity of happiness after you die. But even as a young kid, I couldn't find any comfort in that outcome. It's only later in my life that I gained the intellectual abilities to figure out why. Religion in general makes me think about the little match girl. It's a false consolation. It gives evil and sad things an excuse to exist, because life is only a test to get you to heaven. It devalues life. It discourages you to find any concrete solution to your problems by asserting that the prize for all this pain is an eternity of joy after you died. And what proof does religion give you for all that? None. Just believe it. And maybe it'll make your life a little less miserable while you wait to die. From the moment my grandmother ended the story with an obvious fake smile and a failed attempt to give me some sense of faith, I was on my way to becoming a strong advocate of atheism. I later realized my grandmother never really believed herself. She just thought faith was a virtue, like many unbelievers do. They do? And as I began to study and become aware of how much religious persecution poisoned societies throughout history, and even to this day I had an incremental amount of doubts that faith of any kind was or had ever been a good thing. I couldn't tell what the last straw was, but I know that watching Matt Dillahunty debate with apologists, especially on the topic of slavery in the Bible, made me realize how much people are willing to give horrible excuses to defend their faith, or faith in general. Sam Harris's books made me realize people would rather be ignorant about how badly women are treated in Afghanistan or Iran because they wouldn't have to criticize Islam or the Islamic culture, or be thought of as racist or xenophobes. I realize that never will I associate myself with the ignorance is bliss kind of thinking, but rather with knowledge is power, and that's why I'm an angry atheist. Because religion and faith in general not only tells people and whole societies to condone immoral behaviors and barbaric practices, but it also seduces believers into thinking that whatever gives you comfort is a good thing, and that believing in things without evidence is harmless when in fact it's the root cause of virtually every evil act humans have ever done. Let's go to the switchboard and talk to area code 207. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Kenneth in Maine. Thank you for calling, Ken. What's going on, my friend? Last evening I listened to your podcast on Scientology on math, and the section that that the, your host, uh, I forget the name of the, the last uh, person that you had on, really uh, got my attention how he said that one of the terrible things about Scientology is that it causes those who have left Scientology to be shunned by their family. And myself, having experienced that in many different ways, I was raised in the Assembly of God, and then I was infected by the Mennonite faith through my brother, And I felt I had to leave my family before I was even 18 to find the true church. I felt the Bible taught that we should forsake father, mother, brother, and sister, which I did. My sister told me later that she felt she had lost a brother, and she really had. And then later I joined with the Mennonites and married and had a large family. And as time went on, we got into more and more conservative circles and then later joined with the Amish. And then at one point... I, uh, of course, lost my faith. Previous to that, my brother had lost his faith, and so we were called upon the church to shun him. So I shunned him, wouldn't eat with him, or two of his children that had been members as well, or three. And as I look back at it, I feel very regretful, but I was under that power of, of the group, and I felt I had to do that to please God, to obey the Bible. And then, of course, when I lost my own faith, and then my own family has to shun me. My children could not eat with me at the table. And uh, even some of the businesses here around, the Amish businesses, they try to refuse to do business with me, uh, according to their understanding of the Bible teachings. And then I think of how the children have not a good education, only eight grades of education, and, and are not taught any real true science or to, um, you know, comparative religion to have an open mind and, and create a, a real 
ability to question and to vet information so that they can be balanced people. And uh, as I thought about all those things, I thought how similar it was to Scientology, and I'm sure other of the listeners can relate to it in different sects that they've been involved in. And I guess I feel like that one person that you mentioned is like a, a rumbling volcano. <laughs> Some days I just feel like crying out and saying, why? Why did I waste 30 years of my life in this setting, as some people call religion? I would tend to call it a cult anymore. And all the things that I've lost and all my family. But I I couldn't help but follow what I thought was truth. And I'm very happy with that part, but it does still make me very angry to know what I have to go through. Has your anger motivated you to go out and do battle with religious people? Are you on the offense? Does it, uh, does it affect your life in some way? Do you think it's a, a positive thing, a negative thing? Well, to some extent, when I visit with other people, I've become more and more an outspoken atheist. I, I try to be careful because I'm a little afraid of the repercussions, but as I listen to more and more of your podcast and others, such as the um, Freedom from Religion Foundation and how they're encouraging folks to come out so that we have a better image, I've become more comfortable with just telling folks that I'm an atheist. Uh, that was very hard at first. And then, of course, that initiates conversation, and I'm, I'm free and willing to discuss it. But it is difficult to hear others talk about their love and faith in Jesus when, to me, they just don't understand what they're really promoting. If they would know what they're promoting, what the Bible actually teaches, they couldn't condone it themselves. You know, Ken, I was sitting on the couch watching the news. Natalie and I are sitting there together, dogs on our lap, finishing the day. And there's a tragic story about a semi-trailer that plowed into the side of a bus filled with college students that were on their way back from like a sporting event or something. And I don't know how many people were on the bus, but four of those young people died. I think they were between the ages of 18 and 21. Four tragic and just senseless deaths. And mm. they cut away to someone who was obviously groping for a comfort mechanism in a difficult time. And they said, the family has asked for your prayers. And mm. I blurt out, prayers for what? Where was the hand of God 30 seconds before the semi-truck plowed into the side of the school bus? Where was the hand of mm. God before the tragedy happened, why are we asking him to come now and pat people on the head after their beloved children and siblings and friends and loved ones have been torn from their lives? And I find myself on yeah. the couch getting angry. <laughs> and I don't yeah. know if that's a productive anger. I don't know if it's, an, if it's destructive. But I look at the senselessness of the comment, and I find that welling up inside me. Can you relate to that at all? Yeah, I, I haven't faced that so much, but certainly can relate to that because as I realize that God is a construct of the mind, then God always gets the good end of the deal. It's sort of like the joke, rule number one, the boss is always right. Rule number two, if the boss is wrong, go back to rule number one. <laughs> and it's sort of the same with the, with the God question. God is always right. And if you think he's wrong, then just remember rule number one, God is always right. Yeah. All things work together for our good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So if they're saved in the accident, God's the hero. If they're only partially affirmed, yeah. they should have been killed, God's the hero. If they get called to heaven, they are no longer ah. chained to the pain of this life, they're experiencing eternal bliss, God's the hero. It's very convenient. Well, what's so sad to me and hard for me to accept is recently I have two girls still at home. They're not with me. My wife has left and with the family, so I communicate through letter because they don't have email. And I wrote a letter to the girls after being moved by, by a particular uh, sad story that I watched on a video. It was the story of Anne Frank and when she died and her sister. And I, I just thought of my girls, it was not the same circumstance. And so I wrote my girls a nice fatherly letter and how I loved them and I missed them. And I said, uh, surely you don't believe that anybody that doesn't believe your way is going to burn in hell. I mean, that's a, that's a very cruel thought, you know, even for the worst of criminals. And my 13-year-old daughter wrote me back, and she said, yes, uh, that's exactly the way it is. Uh, anybody that doesn't believe in Jesus will burn in hell forever. It's their choice. They can choose to go to heaven, or they can choose to go to hell. And 
you know, I, I knew almost that she was going to write that, and yet it just so struck me how the indoctrination process starts so young. And they are convinced. That's what just was a face palm moment that I just said, oh, my God, you know, uh, what can I do to help my children to see what I see? It, it's just beyond me. Well, I grieve about the loss of the relationship with your family, but understand, my friend, that family comes in many forms, and so for what it's worth, you've got a community here that has your back. All right, Ken? Thank you very much. I appreciate you so uh, much. Thank Thanks you for, for all you do and your encouragement. Thanks for calling the show, my friend. Take care of yourself. Okay. The stories of shunning, that'll prompt anger in you in a hurry, won't they? I had another listener named Ken. He sent a message and said, My wife and I were walking the dog last night found a pamphlet on the sidewalk on the front. A person stood with outstretched arms in a burst of sunlight. It read, Are you really saved? When I opened it, this was page two and three, and he actually pasted the graphic. He scanned it and sent it to me. It's obviously targeted to young people. Looks like teenagers, young adults. And the questions are, how much time is left in your life? Death comes suddenly and unexpectedly. Did you know that your spirit and soul are eternal and live forever after your physical death? You must be prepared for the life after time is running out fast. All these exclamation points, right? And they've got another section about hell. It shows people writhing in hell. You see the heads of the people and they're coming up and there's flames all around them. Hell is an everlasting burning place where there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. A place of regret where the smoke of those tormented goes up forever and they find no rest day or night. Now they leave these pamphlets out to literally scare the hell out of people, often young people. Yes, that makes me angry. It's not a credible case for belief. There's no evidence for a deity. There's no evidence for miracles, for the historicity of the Christ story or any other deity. There's no meat to this argument. It's all fear pimping. How much time is left in your life? Death comes suddenly and unexpectedly. When I was in church, they would always have the revival preachers come out and they would do these sermons and at the end they'd play the piano and organ music, just as I am without one. <laughs> and they would say, you could leave here tonight on your way home and God could take you like that. Will you be ready? Will you be ready? When you stand before the throne of God, will you be able to say, yes, I accepted your precious gift of eternal life. Come forward and drop to your knees and ask for forgiveness for your many sins. God wants you, all of you tonight. Don't leave here tonight. Don't leave this room without making it right, without making the decision. There are people right now in the audience who have been through those services who are nodding their heads because they've heard it said just like that. The implication is a piano could fall from the 32nd floor of a high rise when you're walking downtown tonight and you could be killed and you go to hell. A plane could fall from the sky. You could fall into a manhole. You could be struck by a car. You could find out you've got a disease that kills people in a matter of hours. Prepare for your death today. Tomorrow may be too late. Yes, that makes me angry. And I think with good reason. Ken, thanks for the message. Jeannie said, I think about this often. Am I one of those angry and militant atheists? People suggest I'm angry at God or angry at religion, but I'm not. I'm bitter. I feel like I went through a nasty divorce and never got resolution on a lot of the issues that made us separate. I'm bitter over the lost time and energy. I'm bitter over all the drama I went through trying to be worthy. I'm bitter over all the guilt that I should have never had to feel. Angry? A bit, yeah but mostly just bitter and sad for my younger self who went through so much for something that was a creation of the imagination. I went through so much for nothing. Nothing at all. Jeannie, if I may encourage you to reframe your past as many believers have reframed their past. You and I have experiences inside the faith, but I don't think it's necessarily wasted time. Because you've seen religion, you've seen these experiences from the inside out, you are much better qualified than many to be able to speak out against why they are wrong and why they should be addressed and changed. And we'll take our lemons and make some lemonade. Be able to, 
you know, say, look, I'm not looking from the outside in talking about the theory of it. I was there. I lived it. I heard it. I felt it. I was there, man. And I tell you this stuff happens and it needs to stop. Your past may be making you more effective at addressing the wrongs done in the name of superstition. Area Code 607, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth, it's uh, John from State New York. Good to hear from you, sir. What's going on, man? I've pretty much described myself and people have described me as being a very angry atheist. And, you know, I sometimes have gotten the same question, you know, you know, why are atheists so angry? And I think one of the conclusions that I've come with, and I don't know, you can just sort of bounce off with me if you feel that way, is just I think that in a lot of ways, Christianity just makes it so easy. As a history teacher, I get angry when the religious right down in Texas want to reframe, or reframe, I should say, things within our textbooks to try to make the history of Christianity look a little less bloody. That makes me angry. I get angry that people like the Rick Santorums of the world can get elected to public office when they say outright that they believe that homosexuality is, quote, a threat to the American family. You know, I get angry when these Christian ministers, you know, I told you about this a long time ago, the people that were picketing Binghamton University, saying that homosexuals are going to hell, or that the books in your library are a waste of time, and the only book that you need is the Bible. That shit makes me angry. And so that's usually my conclusion when I get that question. I think it's just because to us who believe in reason and believe particularly in compassion, the things that these religious rights say is just so easy to get angry about. I disagree with nothing you said, man. I'm totally on that page. I lament, too, that in the political arena, as we are now getting set for the midterm elections, it means that we have to... I don't know if, if how it is in other countries, but here in the United States of America, the presidential race essentially begins about 22 months before people actually cast a ballot. It is an exhausting slog. And I just read mm-hmm. again that Mitt Romney is a front runner to run for president of the United States in 2016. Now, I don't believe that Mitt Romney's a bad guy. A lot of people say he's the devil. I'm not going to go that direction. But it makes me crazy to think that a man who believes in the rose-colored glasses and the seer stone and the angel of Mormon and Moroni and all of the crazy... And the magic Mormon underwear. And the magic Mormon underwear and the planet Kolob or the star Kolob, that person may have access to the button. It makes me crazy. And it's not just him. You know, you've got every other religiously motivated political candidate out there who's going to be running on the God platform. we got a governor in the state of Oklahoma running for midterms, and she and every one of her ilk make sure that they have at least one shot of them in church or in some sort of a worship or a church-like setting looking somber. And they use the word faith in the copy of the text, a person of faith Mm -hmm. and values, a person who cares about the common man. Well, I think they're just playing faith for political points in a hugely conservative red state, and it makes me crazy. It makes me angry. Mm -hmm. I I understand. Absolutely. And going back to the Mitt Romney thing, I wonder, again, uh, the level of his Mormonism is up for debate, but still it's kind of funny to wonder, depending on how deep he is into it, if he would trade off, like, uh, bulletproof vests in the Army and give them magic Mormon underwear instead, you know? Well, the church has distanced itself from the claims of supernatural intervention, although those claims are out there. Most people say that the temple garments act sort of like a wedding ring. It's a reminder of your com- your covenant and commitment, and I think he may stand along those lines. But I think he's a true believer. I know in, uh, was it 2012, 2011, 2012, he donated personally about $4 million to the uh, Mormon mm-hmm. church. And so I don't think that's a half-ass thing. I think he's he's all in. I think he honestly, truly believes it. So I'm just waiting for the day where a Scientologist runs for president. That'd be interesting. <laughs> wow. Oh, Tom Cruise, the State of the Union address. 
Yeah, I can, oh, dear I, can, Lord. I can envision it in my mind. Well, John, thanks for the call. Thanks for being a part of the broadcast, and thanks for listening, all right? Thank you again for having me, sir. All right, take it easy. You too. Yeah, I don't want to become so cynical that I give up on the process. But in some ways, I'm guilty of giving up on the process. I mean, I, I vote, but I feel like I'm voting for the candidate that sucks the least. And it's close. I feel like I'm watching these Pez head, paper thin, poll driven, popularity seeking parasites who are playing God like someone might play a chess piece, parading themselves and their families to church on Sunday, especially when the cameras are around. He's a person of faith, a person of family values, a person who cares about the middle class. His opponent is the devil. That's always how it goes. We have two years of that. Two years of it coming. Makes me crazy. Jamie sent a message and said, Hi, I'm a huge fan of the podcast, and this is the first time I've written in. I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. Really? Jamie doesn't say what town, but I'm really curious. In a fire and brimstone Southern Baptist church, my uncle was the pastor my entire family attended twice weekly. I was raised to not only believe in the rapture, but to expect it at any second. That kind of pressure on a young girl really embedded some intense anxiety. I would bite my nails until they bled. I'd only sleep an hour a night. My hair was falling out for a period of my youth. But it's not just the rapture they were so intense about. I was told if I didn't pray over every morsel of food that entered my mouth, I would be poisoned. This is literally the tip of the iceberg, but you get my point. Five years ago, I sat down and read the Bible. I came out as an atheist two months later. It still feels new and painful to me. I am angry. Very angry. I'm the only atheist in my family. Where once I was a source of pride, as the church song leader and youth organizer, I am now a source of shame. Do I have a right to be angry? I try hard not to be. I'm looking forward to your take on angry atheism. Thank you for all you do. Well, Jamie, fortunately, you are at a place in your life now where you don't have to fit into somebody else's cookie cutter of acceptability, of goodness, of morality, of value, of worth. Now you get to live in a world where people can accept you exactly as you are. And there are tons of us who are absolutely excited for the opportunity to do that. You know, I, my own father sent me a text it's a week and a half ago. We go round and round, right? And they'll go dormant for a while, and then there'll be something else, and then they'll go dormant, and there'll be something else. And we have a sort of a tenuous relationship. It's pleasant on the outside, but there's a lot of undercurrent. And he said in the text something along the lines of, Seth, it's time to come back to the family. And he's speaking about my rejection of his God and my activism as an atheist. I'm a source of shame. Where once he would tell everybody about the Christian concert that I emceed, or the top-ranked Christian radio show, or the Christian music with Christian values, reciting Christian scriptures, even saying Christian prayers on the radio. This is something he couldn't wait to tell people about. He'd bring relatives up to the radio station, give them the tour. He couldn't wait to show off his son. Now, I get a text that says, it's time to come back to the family. You need to come back to the family. What does that sentence say, really? It says that because I don't line up with him, well, I'm not really part of the family. That's what he's saying, right? Until I agree, I don't get the 100%. We hang out together, we see each other at holidays, everybody's going to be pleasant, but until I line up and accept what was drilled into me as a child, until I go there, and line up lockstep, I'm not really family. 
So in a way, even though my situation wasn't nearly as intense as yours, and I'm so sorry to hear about your experience, I can relate. And I will tell you what I told a caller previously, and that's that family comes in many forms. And the beauty of the internet is that community comes in many forms. The beauty of the free thought movement, and in many ways it is a movement, and the gatherings that we have, and the events, and the conventions, and the opportunities to connect that we have, you can find the support you're looking for. Now, will it absolutely, perfectly replace the connection you have with your family? No, it doesn't. I talked to Jerry DeWitt, former pastor turned atheist, about it, and he was talking about how, you know, the, the atheist's in this movement have become his family. It's not quite the same thing, but they've helped to fill that void in his life. And it's effective. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing to not have to bend yourself into some pretzel shape to make sure that somebody else feels comfortable about who you are. You aren't on this planet to make other people comfortable. They're not living your life and just sticking your name on it. Your life belongs to one person. It belongs to you. And your hopes and your dreams and your characteristics and your passions and the things you, you are and want to be, those belong to you. They do not belong to somebody else. And anybody else who would emotionally blackmail you into being a clone of what they are probably doesn't deserve you. One day for their sake, because of all they're missing out on, I hope they come to their senses. I hope your family wakes up one day and says, we have acted disgracefully toward you. You are our daughter. We should have been a parent first, a friend first. We should have accepted you for who you are first. We are so sorry. Please let us make it right. I have a, a hope, a faint hope, but it's a hope that one day they'll do that. Because until then, they're missing out. They're the ones who are missing out on you, who you are, the beauty of you. They're just missing it. They've cheated themselves out of the opportunity to have what you bring into their lives. Fortunately, Jamie, until they do come to their senses, there are many out there who will appreciate you for who you are, for what it's worth. Forgive the tirade. Sorry, it's a sensitive nerve. <laughs> Area code 850. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for calling the broadcast. We're talking about anger tonight. What's your perspective on all this? I wonder if I have a unique perspective because I'm not only an atheist, but I want to be a scientist one day, a biological anthropologist. I love it. The pursuit of science. And um, I guess I feel alone on either side. The atheists don't understand me because I have all this knowledge and they can misrepresent the knowledge. And the scientists don't want to talk about religion because they want to respect people's faith. And I think we shouldn't do that if we want to educate people. And that makes me angry. I haven't seen an aversion to science or scientists within the atheist community. Are there people in your own circle who are non-believers in deities who also reject science? Well, it's not that they reject science. It's that they misrepresent it. They give out the wrong ideas about it. Hmm. Well, I mean, it hasn't been my experience, but I mean, if it's been yours, I'm very sorry to hear it. But I mean, I'd, certainly if you're a rationalist living in the real world, I think science is a great field for you. So I wish you the best in your endeavors. Thank you so much for the call. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I don't see a, a real discrepancy between atheism and, and science. I'm not sure I've, I've made that connection. And I've done a lot of interacting inside this community. So my hope is that her situation is certainly an anomaly. Area code 514. You're on the Thinking Atheists radio podcast. Who's this? Hello, this is Manuela. Manuela, thank you so much for calling the broadcast. We're talking about anger tonight. What do you think? Well, one of the things that really bothers me is intellectual dishonesty. And I just want to share a story about when I was in high school, I had this religion teacher who was, you know, this very intelligent person, very well-spoken and everything. And we learned in this class that the story of Genesis, it didn't actually happen and it should be taken as allegory and all that. But then the ramifications of that are that there's no Adam and Eve, there was no original sin. And like, 
if there's no original sin, why is there Christianity at all? Like, why is there a need for redemption in Jesus? And it's like, it's such a simple leap of thought to make to, you know, to realize that, hang on, this religion is actually based on things that don't make sense. And it's, it's frustrating that so many people who know that Genesis is not factual continue to persist in these old dogmas. It usually comes down to something along the lines of, well, it's a personal relationship. I mean, I know he's in my heart, and I don't really hold too much to the, the Bible's just stories. They sort of distance themselves. Has that been your experience? Yes, but they continue to believe on these premises that they know that aren't true. Well, I've always said that if someone wants to hold a personal faith, that's not really where my gripe lies. If someone says, I believe this, and it is a precious belief to me, it's a free country, knock yourself out. The challenge is, the nature of belief is not to be a personal belief. It's not to move inward. It's to spread outward. And I think that's where you and I may become frustrated because now you have people who aren't even holding to the foundational document of their religion, right? They walk away from the Bible and the book of Genesis, and they then go out and promote a religion outside of the very foundational document it is based on, which makes it even more frustrating. Do you feel that? Yeah, I feel that they're believing in Y, and Y is the logical consequence of X, but they're denying X. And it's, to me, it's a sign of cowardice, almost. Are you an angry person? Do you find yourself getting pissed off when this kind of dialogue happens, when you see examples of this? I don't get pissed off in front of people. I, I usually just speak to them very politely, but I get home and go, ah. Yeah, there's a dent in the sheetrock where you've been banging your head against the wall. I can't believe right? I yeah. had to encounter this argument again. It's so vacuous and empty and pointless and wrong. And then you breathe and have a glass of wine and call it a day, right? <laughs> That's what I try to do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks for your perspective and thanks for being a part of tonight's broadcast. Much appreciated. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. I had an email from Holly who said this. I was going to write first and tell you that I'm not an angry atheist until I was just forced into a rant about creationism and accepted science by a family member who believes in the former and rejects the latter. Now I'm pissed. And I suppose I always am about this. I have a three-year-old son. I have nothing but big dreams for him. I want him to be a happy, well-adjusted, educated, and prosperous adult. I want him to learn how to think when he's in school. I want him to learn important facts when he's in school. I want him learning science in science class. I want him to live on a clean planet Earth, one that's not covered in the garbage of a bunch of ignorant human beings and polluted to the extreme. I want him to live in a world where women aren't second-class citizens, where they're in sole control of their reproductive systems, where they aren't shamed for being sexual people. Moreover, I want him to grow up knowing he's allowed to be an expressive and emotive man, that he doesn't own women, that women don't owe him anything. If it so happens that he is gay, I want him to be able to marry another man and be afforded all the basic human rights as a heterosexual person if he chooses to get married. I shouldn't have to worry about these things. In 2014, the age of intelligence. Oh, Holly, is this the age of intelligence? We're screwed. <laughs> In a time where we've nearly unlimited information at our fingertips, I should never have to worry about creationism being taught in public schools, climate change being blatantly denied in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, nor should I have to worry about him being discriminated against if he identifies as a homosexual when he becomes aware of his own sexuality. Why do I worry? Religion. It really does poison everything. I'm tired of having to defend accepted, peer-reviewed scientific theories and evidence to people who think it's perfectly acceptable to teach my son fairy tales in school. I'm tired of worrying about my reproductive and basic human rights being stripped from me because some religious man thinks he should be in charge of my uterus based on the recommendations of a book that was written so long ago it should be completely irrelevant to life at this point. 
Most of all, I'm sick and tired of watching all the atrocities committed in the name of a god or a religion and being called the horrible person who is less trusted than a convicted rapist because I don't subscribe to that kind of nonsense. I guess I'm more than moderately angry. Holly, yeah, what was that survey that came out a few years ago that atheists are trusted less than rapists here in the United States of America? It's insane. Miguel said, when I heard this week's show was about angry atheists, I knew I had to write in. I think a lot of theists use the term to imply some negative connotation in an attempt to dismiss our arguments and complaints with religion. They use it to discredit us trying to say we should be ignored because we are just upset and not being rational, and therefore we don't know what we're talking about. I don't think we should shy away from the term angry atheist. There's nothing at all wrong with being angry. It's a natural emotion among sentient beings. I think we should own the term. Let's take it over. Let's define why we are angry, and let's use it to drive the conversation. While it's presumptuous to speak for an entire group, especially one as diverse as ours, I feel confident that most would agree that deep down, we are, at least in some aspects, angry. We aren't angry in the manner theists depict us, though. We're not angry with God. We aren't angry because there's no joy in our lives. We aren't angry with the theist, him or herself, because they believe the archaic ramblings of misogynistic goat herders. But there is something that makes us angry, something that pisses us off. What we're mad at, what I'm mad at, is the horrible atrocities that are carried out in the name of religion. I'm angry at the criminal organization known as the Catholic Church. that's avoided nearly all accountability for their employees molesting little boys. They've covered it up, paid people off, moved the offenders to other parishes where they can offend again and all the while having the audacity to tell others how to behave morally. I'm angry with how a majority of theists treat the LGBTQ community, and all because their holy book claims homosexuality is icky. It pisses me off that theists will accuse us of being immoral because we don't have an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good imaginary friend to dictate right and wrong, and thus morality, while failing to comprehend that the book they're holding up while screaming at gay people condone slavery, incest, genocide, child rape, and the subjugation of women, just to name a few things. I'm angry that hundreds of millions of people have died throughout history for simply believing in the wrong God. That's why I'm angry. And to be honest, if someone looks at why I'm angry and they're more concerned with the tone I use or any profanity that I use to express how inexcusable it is, that these horrible things happen in the first place and continue to happen now, then the issue is with them. You ask if I'm angry, you're damn right I am. And I won't apologize for it. Theists better get used to the idea as well, because it won't change until there's complete equality, until people stop being killed for worshipping the wrong deity, until the Catholic Church is brought to justice. I'm angry, and I have every right to be. Miguel, thank you very, very much brings the question of methods, doesn't it? If we're angry, is there a time to temper an angry voice? I was looking at something, was it last week or the week before? And I actually agree with the criticism here. There was a religious couple who had been praying for a young child. The child was sick in some way, and the child died. And of course, a mother and father absolutely devastated. And they were very, apparently, very public believers. And they were very publicly resting on faith as a solution to heal their child. And, as I understand it, a host of atheists commented on the article, I guess God needed another angel in heaven. Little Bobby is with Jesus now. You know, they were essentially sort of turning the screw. Now, they are right in point of fact that this deity was not there to save the life of this precious young child. They are right to say that they needed real medicine instead of mysticism. They were right in trying to find solutions in the real world 
or saying that the family should have focused more on solutions in the real world. They're right in point of fact, but is it right to go and say those things to a grieving mother and father? And I don't think so. I don't think it's enough to be right. I always say that. It's not enough to be right. If we're wanting to change minds, if we're wanting to sort of turn the tide, we have to be effective. And to go and throw something at somebody that is correct on the evidence, but it hits them in the head and knocks them over at the darkest moment of their life, what have you accomplished other than rubbing salt in a wound? There is another way to make this point. There's another more, more effective way to maybe refocus energies and attentions. You know, some self-congratulatory mockery of the death of a child, it just doesn't work. And we should be better than that. And when I say things like that, there's always some section of hipsters out there who are like, man, you're never going to tell me what I'm going to do with my body. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do battle every single day. I'm going to be offensive. I enjoy being offensive. You know what? If religion's offended by me, that's their problem. Now, I'm not saying that we have to kowtow to what religion thinks we ought to be. We have to play by their rules. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we're better than this, aren't we? I mean, living a rational, evidence-based life does not mean we don't have compassion. They're people. Just lost a child. Sometimes when I see the behavior of people who are brandishing the brand atheist out there, I get angry. Because I can't shake the feeling that while they feel real good about themselves, they're doing a lot more harm than good the cause of rationality in this crazy world. It's not enough to be right. We have to be effective. You know, if being right's enough for you, fine. But that's a sad way to live. I want more people to be thinking in terms of science and evidence and curiosity and discovery and living without fear tomorrow than were yesterday. I want that statistic to continue that says that 30 and unders are twice as likely now to identify as non-religious in some way than they were in the year 1990. I love that statistic. I want to see that continue exponentially. How do we do that if we're always rubbing salt in the wounds of the people whose minds we're trying to change? I want to change minds. It's a personal thing with me. And you know, some say I'm too soft and maybe they're right. Now, maybe I should be angry, or maybe I should be more vitriolic, but I, I don't want to be that guy who looks at himself in the mirror, and that's who I am. I just don't want to be that guy. I want to love people. Non-religious, religious, whoever. I just want to love people. Whenever possible. Some make it difficult, but whenever possible, I really do want to approach people as a, as a humanist, as a human being, and not as somebody who's just trying to stick a knife in them. I've got, is it Lazer on Skype? You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hello, sir. This is Gary Ant from the UK. Thank How you so you? much for calling. I'm doing well, doing well. We're talking about anger tonight. What do you think? Well, I think that uh, a lot of it is exposure in the wrong, to what you could see as the wrong people in some ways. Because a lot of the time, who are you going to experience as an atheist? Is it the person who doesn't have a problem with what's going on, who's standing behind you in the queue and doesn't say anything? Or is it the person who, like me, gets angry at education that they keep trying to uh, push forward from the religious point of view? It's someone like me who's getting angry over a particular subject that is the person you're going to meet and realize is an atheist. How many of these people are actually angry atheists? I am an atheist, and on occasion I have gotten angry, but I would say that I'm more of an angry education activist. You get angry science activists. You get people who are angry that they've been lied to. How many of the, is it that are actually angry due to the atheism and are not atheists due to the fact that they're angry over something? Maybe their passion is misconstrued as anger. If we go in and we fight with passion about something that we feel very strongly about and feel the evidence is on our side about, and someone feels attacked because we're speaking out against a sacred belief, 
they might paint us with the anger brush when really that's not what motivates us. I think that's very likely. Also, you were talking to a young woman earlier who said she wanted to be a scientist, and she was saying about scientists not debating religion a lot. I was wondering, a lot of the time, the reason they won't do that is because they know that the people deciding the funding that they get are religious, whether they're politicians or on committees, and they don't want to shake the tree for such reasons. It's not because that they don't agree with the atheists. It's because they don't want to risk their careers and risk the projects they're working on. You know, I also heard a great analogy, and I don't know if this is true. I'd like to vet it. And, but whether or not it is done like this in the real world, I like the way it's phrased. It's been said that people who study counterfeit money don't go out and study just the counterfeits. What they do is they study the real, and they become intimately familiar with real currency, so that when a fake or counterfeit comes along, they can instantly spot it. They haven't been out focusing on the negative, they've been just becoming familiar with the positive. And I wonder if many people in the scientific community, rather than going out and fighting all the negative claims against religion, are simply promoting rationality in their own lives by doing science by conducting experiments, by following hypotheses, by discovering something new every day. Their fight necessarily isn't with religion. Their fight is to go out and be a scientist and try to test and retest and discover what's true and find out what's false and just sort of go forward in that direction. You know, That's their method of being a rationalist. You think that has merit? That sounds rather reasonable. Well, Definitely that's, that's what I do. I sound rather reasonable until you go and think about it later, and then you think, that guy's an idiot. <laughs> he has no idea what he's talking about. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Well, well thanks for... Well, uh, things sound reasonable as sound bites. Well, that's thanks. how Fox News gets by. Oh, uh, don't even get me started on Fox News. Fox News makes me angry. Thanks, uh, thanks for being a part of the broadcast, my friend. Thanks for listening. It means a lot. Great show, Seth. Thanks All right. for uh, having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure. Justin sent a message and said, religion killed my best friend and brother-in-law, Brian, when a life-saving blood transfusion was refused after surgery July 4th, 2012. Brian was brilliant and full of life and humor and one crazy son of a bitch. I loved him like a brother for most of my life. We went to college together. We drank together. We watched violent and irreverent movies. Obviously, he was not a very good Jehovah's Witness. When he married my then wife's sister, we had the bond of family, and our children became very close. He brought four children into the world and died mere months after little Ivan was born. I never wept so hard as I did at his funeral last year. I love him still and miss him so much. Such a stupid, unnecessary death. Religion has ripped apart our family. At first, it was the alienation of three of my older siblings because they never got baptized and refused to become Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember Mom crying over them all the time and Dad talking about what wicked idiots they were. We hardly saw them. They all left our household as soon as they could. Now I'm the black sheep, an atheist living in sin with my girlfriend. They won't visit. They won't talk. When I do get a rare call from my mom, she speaks to me as if I'm a stranger. You bet your ass I'm angry. Sometimes I feel I could tear down the edifice of the Watchtower and Bible Track Society with my bare hands and stomp it into oblivion. Sometimes I'm so depressed that I feel paralyzed to do anything at all. It took years to deprogram from their bullshit after finally leaving. The whole story is far too long to tell. But on the bright side, there's a strong internet community for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and atheists alike. And there are podcasts like the Thinking Atheist and Dogma Debate. I can't describe what your work means to me. I can only say thank you, Justin. Thank you, man. You know, it's funny. We did that show, was it last year, on the Jehovah's Witnesses? I used to think that Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons were just kind of these happy, weird people. And then you discover what an insidious organization it is. And the horrors of shunning and how they treat people behind closed doors. I mean, it's just, it's staggering. And we have a lot to be angry about. 
I know certainly you do. I mean, having seen it firsthand, I'm sorry about the loss of your friend. David from Australia said, I'm a gay man in my 60s, and my partner and I have been together for almost 40 years. We live in Australia where we should be able to enjoy all the privileges and rights that everyone else enjoys. But because of the current federal government's particular right-wing religious stance, the likelihood of marriage equality occurring is not that great. So as John and I are getting older, it's probably hopeless to imagine we'll be able to marry before we die. We both worked in public service positions during our working lives and have contributed in many ways to society, both personally and in the form of taxes. And although we enjoyed our jobs, we're both now retired. There have been quite a few advances here in Australia regarding equality measures for the GLBTI community. But that one last hurdle of gay marriage seems to be a bridge too far for our current prime minister, who at one stage in his life was training for the Catholic priesthood. Now, it has to be said, I could never be described as being an angry man, but if you want to know what really makes me an angry atheist, I'll tell you. It pisses me off that civil laws that we all have to live by are formulated and legislated for by those who have religious faith or by religious lobby groups who can somehow manipulate the legislative processes. Our government should be a government for all of its citizens, not just those with faith. If this was indeed the case in Australia and all civilized countries, there would not currently be all this nonsense about whether or not gay people should be treated equally with everyone else. David. Bonnie said this, For a long time I didn't consider myself an atheist, despite having been one since I was eight years old. I was raised Roman Catholic and believed in the kingdom of heaven solidly for those first eight years. But I began asking questions when my CCD class made us all take our first confession. If you didn't confess your sins and ask forgiveness, you would go to hell. I began asking the nuns and priests, innocently not to incite anger, began asking about people who could not confess due to the inability to speak. Are those too young to have a first confession? Were they forced to suffer hell? What about those who didn't know about confession? This being the one true religion, the right religion, everyone must conform to these rules. The questions of an eight-year-old can be relentless. I was removed from that church and sent to another. A total of three moves were made before my family gave up on me, though I was forced to get confirmed despite being threatened with another move for refusing to take a middle name that was not Thomas. I was certain no one doubted more devoutly than I, and I deserved that name despite my gender. Fast forward 20 years. I just finished my military service and had time on my hands. The Internet's a brutal place, and I was happy to fight this war as well. The military can make a girl vicious. My friend had decided on the public forum that is Google+, Plus, that the reason America is floundering is because God's law is not part of the legal system. I stood my ground and relentlessly spoke reason until I was banned from his page. It was at that moment I became an angry atheist. I'm a difficult voice to silence, and this attempt at doing so turned me into a very loud advocate. I began moderating atheist websites and began my own page, The Mad Ramblings of an Angry Atheist, found at the loyal opposition tumblr.com. But the one thing that did come of that was my rebuttal to the requirement of religion in order to be good or useful. I wrote the following, and it's been passed around the internet. It's been altered, it's been stolen, but I honestly can't be angry. I'm not angry because it's maintained its meaning, and that's the important part. It's attached here in its original form, and it says this. I am an atheist. I do kind things without the promise of reward. I avoid doing cruel things without the threat of punishment. I take full responsibility for all my actions, both good and bad. I can feel empathy, hope, sadness, pain, happiness, and love. I can understand things and still stand in awe of their beauty and complexity. I refuse to accept because as an answer to any question. I encourage asking questions, digging deeper, and challenging the known. I offer my time, my expertise, my knowledge, my help, and my hand without expectation. I have morals. 
I feel no shame toward my body nor anyone else's. I'm able to believe in the unseen, unfound, and unknown. The universe is vast beyond my comprehension, and I'm grateful for unanswered questions, for something to strive for and to reach for. I learn for the sake of knowledge. I believe that my mark must be made now, here, on this planet, while I exist. Once I'm gone, I'll be nothing more than the nutrients I took while I lived. I believe this is my one chance, this one little life of mine, to do all the things I want to do and see all the things I want to see, to say everything I think and to absorb all the things I don't know. I don't get to come back and try again. There's no other life. There's no karma to ensure fairness. There's just me. And that's an amazingly empowering thing to acknowledge. It's just me. An eternal mind inside a perishable body. What this mind thinks can leave an indelible mark, and I promise it will be beautiful, helpful, and full of joy. I am an atheist. I am a beautiful, biological machine. I am capable of anything a theist is capable of. That was ultimately my response to the friend and to anyone who's convinced that if you don't have religion, you're worthless. It was that exchange that made me an angry atheist. And while my fury is cooled, it does crop up from time to time. Beware the arguing points of an angry woman who also happens to be a scientist. I'm an insufferable smarty pants, and I'm proud of it. I will never allow my worth to be dictated by religion or the lack thereof. There's so much more to this story than I can fit in an email, but I've taken up enough of your valuable time, and I truly appreciate the opportunity to have my voice heard on your show. Thanks and kindest regards, Bonnie. Bonnie, thank you so much for the message. You know, we've only dipped our toe in the ocean here tonight when it comes to the issue of anger. I wanted to sort of cap the show with my own thoughts on anger, if I may. Not really brilliant, but it's from the heart. When I think about anger, it's such a strange word. It can mean so many things. It has so many shades to it. You know, anger can be mild, it can be moderate, it can be intense. Anger can be warranted, unwarranted, it can be constructive, destructive, it can empower us and strengthen us, it can eat away at us like a cancer, like a toxin. It can just kill us from the inside out. It can mean everything. It can mean nothing. And if there's something about anger, it's, it's something that all of us have experienced, probably in almost all of its forms at some point or another, don't you think? Anger. I was in my late 30s when I first started to feel real, tangible anger in regard to religion. In my own life, I kind of felt like I'd been duped. You know, I was, I was duped. All that time, I wasn't given the tools or the permission to live my own life. I was mad because I felt like I'd been used when I was a young person. They probed me up on stage to be a representative for a generation. I had no idea what I was talking about, but these religious people, they just, they love it. Oh, he's a well-spoken, clean-cut young man. Let's put him up there. Let's let him represent. And maybe he'll make other converts. I felt like I was used. From podium stages, classrooms, chapels. I was angry that nobody, nobody in my inner circle has really ever challenged me to test the waters. Except for one person. There's one person on my family tree who has given me wonderful, honest passionate dialogue, back and forth dialogue. Everybody else, everybody else has either been mute or went straight into judgment mode. Right? They're not interested in testing the scriptures. They don't want to test the historicity, the morality, the believability, the nature of God. They don't care. It's like they didn't fall in love with Yahweh or Jesus. They fell in love with the idea of Yahweh or Jesus. This idealized version that they handcrafted in their own mind. 
Never mind what the Bible says. Some of it's for yesterday, some of it's for today, some of it's literal, some of it's parable. You know, ignore the Old Testament, read the New Testament. You know what? Forget the Bible. It's all about a personal relationship. Everybody's got a different Jesus. Different characteristics. A different face, a different voice. Everybody's doing their own thing. So you question that and they say, well, you're the problem. Yeah, that made me angry. I was angry about the wasted years. A lot of wasted years. I was angry at my parents. Not in a way where I blame them for being bad people. You know, you lied to me. I, that's not where that came from. You purposefully led me astray. I, I couldn't be angry at them for that reason because it wasn't the truth. They were operating because they sincerely believed it was true and that they had to raise us this way as good mothers and fathers. But there's a resentment within me for getting it wrong and not allowing me to challenge. Yeah, that makes me angry. Makes me angry when they don't understand at all and don't care to understand why their beloved son would walk away. I'm angry that their belief system causes them to temper the word love with a kind of piousness and pity for the black sheep that may one day be brought back into the fold. Let's pray for him today. I'm angry that sometimes I feel, and some may say this is in my head, that even when you're being embraced by a religious family member, you're a little bit at a distance. If you hold them too close, if you give them too much, well, that might be construed as an endorsement of their lifestyle. So yeah, you can connect, but keep a portion of yourself protected and on reserve to make sure that no one would ever think that you agree with any of this nonsense. That makes me angry. I'm angry that any parent anywhere could have a greater loyalty to an invisible father than a flesh-and-blood child. How many of those stories did we hear tonight? I'm angry that most of the branches on my family tree don't get it and don't care to, and so many on your family tree don't get it and don't care to. It's conspicuous, really, how many questions have not been asked. Very few people that you and I cross paths with are curious. If you discovered something truly amazing that wasn't religiously oriented and you told them that you had discovered something, they would be all over you. Emails and texts, let's go to dinner, we got to talk. What happened? I can't wait, the suspense is killing me. On this topic, silence and occasionally distance. In some instances, a great distance and a great silence and it's tragic. I get angry with myself for taking so freaking long to figure out what is honestly a, a pretty easy answer to the question. Is there any proof that gods exist? It's not that difficult, really. It's not a hard question. What took me so long? Some people got there in a matter of days. It took me decades. Now, I understand, logically, the power of childhood indoctrination and the reinforcing by religious families and communities that keep people in line. Everybody agrees. Nobody challenges. It becomes your normal. I understand it. Logically, I get it. But it's still not an excuse, really. And I get pissed off at myself for not being a brighter bulb. I'm a dumbass. You ever feel that way? I find opportunities to get angry when I look around. I saw a news report of a guy just a few days ago in my home state of Oklahoma. Some dude at a food processing plant beheaded a woman. He's a proponent of Islam, and the media seems reluctant to talk about it. I read one story, was it yesterday about it? And there was a mention of Islam at the very bottom. Don't you think this is something we should be talking about, especially with all the other headlines going on in the world? It gets a pass because it's Islam? 
I get angry when I see politicians turning their congressional seats into bully pulpits to impose what ought to be a personal religious conviction upon everybody else in their constituency. They're supposed to represent all of us. I get angry when our own court system doesn't seem to understand how the words under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, not part of the original version of the pledge, but inserted during the Red Scare of the 50s, how under God actually implies that non-believers or those who just want to maintain the wall between church and state somehow love their nation less than believers in God do. I get angry when I see people declare that non-heterosexuals don't deserve the benefits of marriage. And the arguments along this path boggle my mind. And I, I'm embarrassed how often I've heard, well, you know, the next step is sex with animals. Mm-hmm. Men start having sex with men, women start having sex with women. You know, the next step is sex with animals. It's depravity. It's a slippery slope. And it starts right here. We got to draw the line. Yeah, that's right, because animals are consenting adults who can sign a marriage contract. And then if they have someone who's non-hetero in their own life, they take that kind of that pitiful hate the sin, love the sinner mentality. You know what? We need to show them the love of Jesus. You know, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Oh. On a personal note, as an activist and host of this community since 2009, I get angry when I have to hear and respond to constantly the same lazy, ridiculous, stupid, asinine, back assword, scientifically and often morally bereft, apologetic defenses of religious belief. They won't go away. They won't go away. And they just suck the life out of me. With so much other stuff we need to be talking about. So much other stuff we can be doing and discovering. We're still talking about the complexity of the eye. The sanctity of scripture. Pascal's wager. Better safe than sorry. I'd rather believe in God and be wrong. Something from nothing. Accidents. Like that Feuerstein fellow was talking about how everything believes it's all just a cosmic accident. Well, that's not the argument. It's not factually tenable. It's not even what we're saying. It's a huge misrepresentation, and yet that word flying around out there. Morality. How can you be moral? How can you know that the abuse of a child is wrong if you don't have our objective moral standard? And the context. It's all, all of it makes sense in context. Thousand-year-old people and talking animals. That makes sense if you put it in context. Dragons and flying chariots of fire and people walking on water and levitating into the sky and demon-infested pigs and floating zoos. Yeah, it all makes perfect sense as long as you keep it in the proper context. People who hold the Bible up as absolute fact and then tell me in the next breath to ignore the entire Old Testament and only read the New. And Jesus made all that Old Testament business just kind of yesterday's news. Pisses me off. Another Noah's Ark discovery. We're actually due. I think it's been a couple of years. So watch the headlines, folks. Fear pimps scaring young children with hell. Makes me angry. Makes you angry. The bumper sticker platitudes that come out of these religious Tony Robbins types, these motivational guys like Pastor Joel Osteen, the guy who talks about helping other people in a world where 30,000 people starve to death every single day while he enjoys a personal net worth of $40 million. Yeah, I think it's unjust, and I'm angry about it. I get angry that people are subsidizing this. I get angry about the waste, the misdirection, the lies, the sincere people who pitch lies thinking it's truth, the blind allegiance to these primitive books, primitive thinking, just the whole thing. And I think anger can be healthy. Sometimes it's healthy. Sometimes it's the natural response. Sometimes it's the only appropriate response. Sometimes anger is what motivates me. It's what gets me in motion. Gets me off my ass and gets me in the game. It's fuel for the engine, man. But I'll tell you this much. 
Anger does not define me. I refuse to let it define me. More than anything else, certainly more than anger, I want to be defined by a determination to face every day with my eyes wide open. That's what I want. Question everything. Discover as much as possible. See everything. Face difficult questions honestly. If you don't know, just shrug and say, I don't know. Let's try to find out tomorrow. I want to extract all the good stuff from life. Instead of cordoning people off because they're different than me or they don't fit into this primitive text over here, to celebrate that they are different from me and to bring them into my life and make my life that much more colorful. That's what I want to do. I want to make sure at the end of the game I've left everything on the field, man. I didn't sit on my hands and apologize and worry too much about everybody else being comfortable. I went out and did what I could. And anger will happen, but it's, it's a small part of a larger passion. The desire to exist without fear, without regret, without abiding the stupid, the offensive, the false, and the destructive stuff out there. It's a single gear in the complex machine. You know, I see it. I know it's there. Sometimes I need it. I work to control it. I want to keep it in perspective. I will not apologize for it. I won't say, you know, I'm sorry I get angry sometimes. In fact, I might just look you in the eye and say, you know what, if you genuinely care about truth, about justice, about goodness, about what's right, why aren't you angry with me? You shouldn't be who we are. But there are times when you and I, we need to be angry. And hopefully that anger will affect some positive change to create an environment where tomorrow we have less to be angry about. I hope the show has been, if nothing else, maybe a little cathartic for you tonight. Thank you so much for listening to the broadcast, for supporting this show. I will see you in a week next Tuesday night right here on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Take care. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. Thethinkingatheist.com. 